the front insurance? If you can do the back, I can do the front. I'm sorry? How long does it take for this? It takes 10 minutes, but people can still come in. But if you can handle the end, I can handle the front. Thank you. Yes, I didn't come back to play with the volume as well. Thank you. I gotta talk to your parents before you come in, okay? So we're doing some filming today. So we just want to make sure that when we get to the second time, well, we get to the second time, we're gonna exercise and remain very quiet. Can we do some filming? Okay? Alright? And then we're gonna round the corner here. They like to hang out under the rocks. Alright, so if you are looking for the axolotls, you are looking underneath rocks and at the bottom of the habitat. And you said this right here is a female who's an in, uh, an albino? Yep. And is that very rare? Um, in the wild, it's pretty rare, but um, these animals have been used for years uh, in laboratories, so they've been bred um, to have more albino individuals than would naturally occur. So they're, they're less, less rare here at the zoo. All right, so Mark is a amphibian keeper here at the Detroit Zoo. So Mark, can you give us a... Um, little bit of information about an axolotl. So what makes them a amphibian and not another species of animal? So amphibians are uh, particularly interesting and unique because um, even the word amphibian kind of means kind of a dual life. So most amphibians live um, as a larva or as a juvenile in a, an aquatic habitat or an aquatic state. And then they eventually metamorphose into a terrestrial animal. So this is another reason the axolotl is unique because these animals are actually neotenic meaning that they actually retain their larval characteristics throughout their life and some of these characteristics are what exactly so some of those characteristics include um, external gills so if you look on the side of the head there you can see those kind of red fluffy plumes those are actually um, gills that help the uh, axolotl breathe under the water so that's one of them they also retain their, their paddled tail, um, and that's useful for locomotion in an aquatic environment. Um, so these animals are critically endangered in the wild, is that correct? Yep, that's correct. Um, and what are some reasons that play into uh, them being endangered? What are some threats that they face sure. in the so, wild? So um, this particular species is found in uh, the southern parts of Mexico City in a very, very few, few lakes, only a couple lakes out there. So. They're very vulnerable, so um, pollution is a big one, um, habitat degradation and uh, climate change, and a lot of those uh, lakes that they live in have been drained in order to um, provide drinking water to uh, folks living in Mexico City. So habitat degradation is a very, very important uh, reason these animals are critically endangered. Um, and so what is their habitat like in the wild? Okay, so these are, uh, these are an animal that lives in uh, in lakes, freshwater lakes, so they're very still, they're not fast moving, so they're very still kind of uh, placid lakes. And they're warm, they're in obviously in, in Mexico, so they're warm, um, freshwater lakes is their preferred habitat. All right, so this is a beautiful habitat over here. You have the rocks and you have the greens. Who's responsible for uh, building these habitats, um, staging them and making, that, make, making sure that they meet the animals' needs as close to the wild as possible? Sure, that's a great question. So here at the NACC, um, the keepers actually do fabrication themselves. So we actually do cement work, um, we do plumbing, so we build, um, most of these these smaller habitats here ourselves and then we prop them according to um, kind of the natural history of whatever amphibian we're working with so um, these in particular you look at different uh, factors in uh, how they live so if they live in the water you have to have an aquatic environment if they prefer trees you'd have to have lots of uh, arboreal space for them to inhabit so you have to kind of specifically um, tailor that habitat to how that animal lives in the wild and we do all of that here at the net all right, well, you guys do a great job. This is another <laughs> thing that most people don't realize zookeepers do, but it is National Zookeeper Week, so we wanna say thank you for all you do, including making these beautiful habitats for the animals that best meet their needs. Right. Um, so, so I actually got a question here that asks about the temperature of the water. Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned that it was warm. Do you have a specific temperature? Um, these guys will stay in, in here in this habitat. It's in the 70s. It'll be in the upper 70s. Um, some amphibians, that's, you know, kind of a higher temperature. A lot of the other amphibians in this gallery can live 
in water temperatures low is, is, in, the, is in the 60s. So mid, mid range to, to higher 70s is usually, uh, Fahrenheit is usually the temperature range for this species. Right, so the amphibian keepers here at the zoo actually care for more animals than probably any other department because they, there are so many amphibians that live here inside uh, the NAC. Can you talk a little bit about some of the conservation work that you are involved in that you found most rewarding? Sure, um, well for me specifically, I work with, um, you know, I don't work with axolotls um, in conservation particularly, but I do work with the Panamanian golden frog and I'm able to travel to Panama and um, assist with some of the conservation efforts in that country. And in that country, we're building and helping renovate uh, shipping containers in order to breed endangered animals from Panama, such as the golden frog, animals like that. So for me, that experience every year is very rewarding and it really, um, it's really impactful and it's, I'm really grateful that the zoo is able to uh, let us uh, help out these different uh, organizations in different countries. So what? Amphibians all over the world are facing um, problems and threats that have led to mass extinction in a lot of different species. What are some threats that local salamanders face? Um, and what are some local types of salamanders? Um, and what can people do to help their local species? Sure, so um, here in Michigan, we have lots of really interesting amphibian species. We have salamanders um, like the uh, Eastern tiger salamander, the marbled salamander, and the spotted salamander. Um, some of which we actually do our own um, uh, research project on here in Oakland County, so we're keeping track of a lot of these species ourselves. Um, some things that people can do on their own is um, there's actually a program called Frog Watch where it's a uh, civilian science program that um, people who can go out in the wild and go out into nature preserves and, and report on what frog calls they hear, they can report those to um, a database and that way we can keep track of what amphibians are present and where within within the state, and that really helps in um, kind of deciding where, uh, where and how to use our resources to help them best. So that's something that you could do on your own. Um, even through the Detroit Zoo, um, we have that program uh, called Frog Watch. So that's one thing you could definitely do. All right. So I got a question here about how fast oxalotos regenerate. So can you talk a little bit about what it means to regenerate, and then you can answer that question. Yeah, as well. yeah. I don't think I talked about that yet, and that's one of the more fascinating things about this species is axolotls can actually regenerate everything from limbs to organs and even parts of their own brain. So these regenerative abilities can take anywhere from two to five weeks, depending on how big the uh, the regenerative uh, process has to make up for. So is in as few as a couple weeks they can regenerate part of a limb so they're uh they're very good at that and it's something that um obviously uh you know a lot of different medical uh institutions are looking at because it would be a very valuable thing for uh, for human medicine as well okay while we're looking for the other axolotl that's on habitat can you let us know how many of this species do you guys care for here at the NAC? so here at the NAC right now we have um we have let's see we have five in the back so in one of our holding rooms we have five and then we have three on exhibit here on habitat so that would make a total of eight that we have here at the dzs currently and you mentioned the back, so a lot of the work that you guys do here at the NAC is behind the scenes. Can you talk about a little about a day in the life of an amphibian keeper at the Detroit Zoo? Sure, sure. Um, that's why I did this for a living. There's never a dull moment. Um, there's lots of stories at the end of each day. So here at the NAC, a lot of our, our daily, um, you know, our daily duties include feeding the animals, um, you know, doing water changes and cleaning the animals, cleaning filtration. Um, like I mentioned before, doing habitat for, you know, fabrication. Um, but we also, a lot of the bread and butter, really what we do here is breed endangered animals for release into the wild. So um, a lot of those back rooms that um, you previously mentioned are dedicated to breeding some of the world's most endangered animals. So a very large portion of our day is spent caring for um, um, breeding and uh, feeding and cleaning those animals. All right, another question about the regeneration. Do other species of salamanders regenerate? Is this common amongst salamanders? Um, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure. I know there are a few species that can do some limited regenerative, um, you know, uh, processes, but there are none that can do it really as, as, uh, as well and as quickly and as thoroughly as the axolotl can. Which species in need of help do you wish the NAC was part of? Did it, not sure I understand. Which 
species in need of help. Okay, so what species that's not here do you oh, wish you sure. could help with? <laughs> okay, um, man, um, that's that a That is question. a great question. Um, you know, there's a lot of different um, amphibian species that are threatened throughout the world. Um, there's a lot of different um, canopy species in South America I'd love to work with. Um, I could rattle off some Latin names, but um, I'll save you, guys, save you guys that. Um, so yeah, there's to me, I think that there's just a lot of work to do um, in amphibian conservation. And, um, you know, I guess I would say that almost all of them really, um, there's a lot of really important species out there that uh, need a lot of help. So we, we do a lot of that here, but you know, um, I bet we could even do more. So, you know, I would love to see uh, us do a lot more. It's hard to say. See if we have any other questions. So you said that there were eight um, axolotls here in the, uh, at the zoo. Mm -hmm. What do you guys feed them? Good question. So um, previous to this uh, Facebook Live event, I threw some earthworms in there. So they like earthworms. You can kind of see the albino individual in the back looking around, um, trying to sense those worms. So they like worms. We feed them fish um, and different invertebrates like crickets and other things like that. And is that similar to what they would be eating in the wild? Yeah, yeah, it is similar. Um, maybe not the exact same species of invertebrates, but we do try to breed a wide variety of insects here. We do a lot of the insect breeding ourselves in order to provide a really diverse diet for these amphibians. So. Um, yeah, they like to eat a lot of different stuff, and it would be very similar to what they would, uh, they would eat in the wild. All right, if you have any more questions, go ahead and send them in right now, but because we are about to be all done, and thank Mark for our time here, um, taking a look and learning a little bit more about the axolotls here at the Detroit Zoo. All right, I just wanted to say thank you again, Mark, for joining us. Have a My happy uh, Zookeeper Week. Thank and you. we are very glad for the work that you do here and for doing such a good job taking care of all the animals. Oh, shucks. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, I have one more question before we oh, all go. Right. Um, how often do they get fed? So um, these guys are on a twice-weekly feeding schedule right now. So a couple times a week, we'll, uh, we'll feed these guys through the back of the habitat. All right, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. If you would like to learn more about axolotls, be sure and send in your questions and we'll be sure to answer them throughout the week.